Let's see if I see it. All right, we thank the Lord for his goodness unto us once again, and we're going to look into the Word of God tonight, and we're going to get right to it. One verse for our thought tonight, Revelation chapter number 3, and verse number 20. Revelation chapter 3, and verse number 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Here in the third chapter of Revelation, we obtain a picture of Christ trying to get the attention of his church. Many times this scripture is used in reference to Christ knocking on the door of a sinner's heart. But I can assuredly say from the scriptures tonight that Christ is not knocking on the door of the sinner's heart. If you were to go into the introduction of this particular letter, it was written to a church or a congregation in Laodicea. And the letter was addressed to someone. It was addressed unto the angel. The angel in the Revelation is nothing more than a messenger. And we're not preaching a Revelation message tonight. We're drawing a thought from Revelation tonight. But the angel in the Revelation is a representative of the ministry. They're nothing more in the Greek than messengers. And so this letter was written to the ministry of the church of God located in Laodicea. And I think sometimes as we read about Laodicea and we hear so much preaching about it, we sometimes forget to understand to whom the letter was addressed. He addresses it to the angel because the angel was responsible for the condition in which that local congregation was found. And if a local congregation is found to be below the standard of God's eternal word, God holds the ministry of that local congregation responsible. See, the ministry in every age has been given a heavy responsibility It is the responsibility and the job of the ministry to ensure the well-being of the flock. He is responsible for feeding the flock. The ministry is responsible for warning the flock. The ministry is responsible for preaching the gospel, laying on of laying on the hands, laying on hands of the sick. Amen. There's a great responsibility that comes with being a minister of the gospel. And so when these letters were penned, when they were written, they were written to the ministry. Because that's who he held responsible. And as he gets to the end of his address to the Laodicean church, verse number 20 says, I stand at the door. And he's knocking at the door. 
The only reason why anyone knocks on a door is to gather the attention of someone who is on the inside and usually to notify someone that you're on the outside of the door, desirous to get on the inside, you knock. Again, this is not written to the center man. This letter was addressed to the church in Laodicea. His, and he's giving us a picture of him saying, let me in. Let me in. He says, if any man hear my voice, not just, what is the knocking? It's the message. Is anybody hearing the message that I'm trying to send to this church? See, out of all the churches that he wrote to, it seems like at the very least they heard it. But when he writes to Laodicea, it's almost like he doesn't even exist. They don't even notice he's not there. They don't hear his voice. He said, if any man will hear my voice and open the door, because certainly if you hear my voice, you're going to open the door. If you can awaken to this message, and we'll maybe dig into this message a little bit, what he wrote at the end of this message, Lord willing, but that's not the focal point so much tonight, the message. But I want us to get a picture of Christ standing on the outside of his church, addressing the very people that claim to be his people, He's knocking on the door and they don't even notice he's not there. If any man will hear my voice and will open the door, I will come in. I'll abide. I'll sup. I'll fellowship. But you got to open the door. This church, this congregation had a lot of things going for them. They were wealthy. They were prosperous. They had maintained success materially. Laodicea was one of the most commercially wealthy in geographic locations in Asia Minor. But they were missing the very essence that made the church the church. They were missing Christ. Our thought tonight what's missing? What's missing? Go with me to Judges chapter 16, please. Something's missing. Sad to say, this is depicting the condition around the church of God, the church of our time. That Jesus Christ is on the outside knocking to get into his church and nobody for the most part, is heeding the message that he's actually trying to bring to Laodicea. Draw a few thoughts here in Judges 16. In verse number... Eighteen. And when Delilah saw that he, being Samson, had told her all his heart... He gave his affections to this woman. He opened himself up to this woman. He became attached to her. And all the while, the very thing that he was attaching himself to was going to turn on him. And when Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called for the lords of the Philistines saying, come up this once, for he hath showed me all his heart. Listen, this time, it's check and mate. I know I got him this time. I have wrapped Samson up. I have wearied him. I have worn him out where he is now just going to succumb to my whims. 
Then the lords of the Philistines came up to her and brought money in their hand. And she made him sleep. She put him to bed. After she had cut him through with a dagger, she had pierced where it hurt the most. She had his secret. And she was about to betray him. She put him right to sleep. Take your rest now. Take your ease, Samson. And she made him sleep upon her knees. Oh, and she looked so beautiful. She was such an attractive woman. Samson had given his heart and his life and the thing that was the dearest to him, which came from Almighty God, his strength, the vow that he had made before God. But this woman was able to so attract him, so impress him, and he became so in love with her. She put him right to sleep. And she called for a man. And she caused him to shave off the seven locks of his head. And she began to afflict him. And his strength went from him. But you know what? Samson didn't even know. Samson could not even perceive what had happened to him. His strength was gone, his he but he was made to feel so comfortable. He was put to sleep. He relaxed to such a degree that he lost the very strength that was given to him by Almighty God and he didn't even know it. And she said, The Philistines be upon thee. Samson, and he awoke out of his sleep. He arose. He got out of his slumber. He was going to deal with the Philistines. And he said, I will go out as other times. God's with me. He's been with me in the past. He's been with me. Listen, the warning signs were there for Samson. He's messing around with Philistine women. He's running in and out of trouble. Honestly, Samson to me is one of maybe the most heartbreaking stories in the Bible. A man with such potential. God had an assignment, had a plan for his life, which the overarching plan for Samson's life was that he would deliver the Israelites from the hand of the Philistines. And where does he die? I appreciate that God gave him a chance and the mercy of God and led him to the pillars, but he wasn't supposed to die down there with the Philistines. That wasn't the assignment. That wasn't what God had for him. Amen. Listen, I'd rather just do the assignment that God has for me than to be trying to beg for mercy at some point. Amen. And not know whether or not I'm going to get it. He awoke out of his sleep and he said, I will go out as other times. I'm, this is just going to be another day at the office. This is just going to be business as usual. I'm, I'm Samson. I'm an Israelite. I'm strong. Amen. I know that I don't, I don't, I've beaten the Philistines before. I've had sex, success before. But it was different this time. It was different this time. Payday came. Why? He gave something away. He lost something. He lost something. He was put to sleep. Amen. And he lost his strength. He said, I will go out as other times before and shake myself. I'm going to shake myself. I'm going to stir myself. Yeah, I've been asleep. Yeah, I've been lukewarm. Yeah, I've been, I haven't been where I should be, but I'm just going to go out as other times. And he wist not. He didn't even know. That the Lord was departed from him. He did not even realize. He had got himself into such a fix. He had got himself into such a condition. That the very presence of God had left him. And he didn't know it. Dear one, it is possible for the very presence of God to leave you. And you not even know. There are people tonight that think they are saved. They think they are sanctified. They think they are in truth. 
and they don't even know. What, if I, I, I'll take you there maybe later, Revelation chapter 3, it said, and knowest not. It's the same thing. You don't know your true condition. You have been put to sleep in this lukewarm age that you don't even sense, you don't even know yourself spiritually. You have things in your life that are short of the gospel. You are not measured to the word along every line. You have justified things along the way. And you are in a place where God has departed from you and you don't even know it. See, people have learned to live without Christ being in the midst. They have learned to live without Christ being in their individual life. They have learned to live without Christ being in their home. They have learned to live without Christ being in their congregation. They have learned to live with it being missing. They've justified themselves to such a degree. They've gone over it and they've gone over it and they've gone over it. And Christ has departed. He's on the outside. And they don't even know he's gone. Go with me over to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel. They keep having revivals. They keep having camp meetings. They keep testifying. They keep singing. They keep preaching. And they don't even know that God is not with them anymore. 1 Samuel 4, verse number 1. And the word of Samuel came to all Israel. Now Israel went out against the Philistines to battle and pitched beside Ebenezer and the Philistines pitched in Aphek and the Philistines put themselves in array against Israel and when they joined battle Israel was smitten before the Philistines and they slew of the army in the field About 4,000 men. The Philistines were always attacking Israel. It was their common foe, their recurring enemy, their arch rival. But this time the Philistines were having success. And if you look at the backdrop of how this occurred in Israel, this is under the priesthood of Eli. And Eli himself was not involved in the most egregious abominations. Eli himself was not necessarily sleeping with women in the tabernacle. Eli himself was not preparing a dish that was supposed to be sacrificed to the Lord and eating it. He didn't prepare it. Eli himself was not going beyond the ordinary. But you know God held Eli quite responsible for the conditions that were going on. He was not the only priest. He was the high priest. He had a more authority. He had a little more position. Really, the reason him being the high priest meant that he went into the holiest of holies on the day of atonement. He was a type of Christ. In a sense, he, he, he fulfilled Christ's priestly role. But there was a problem in Israel. And there was a problem with the ministry of Eli. The biggest problem in Eli's ministry was not what he was actually doing. The biggest problem in Eli's ministry is what other ministers were doing and he was doing nothing about. The biggest problem in Eli's ministry is that he would not restrain the other priests that happened to be his family. See, they were fooling around. Eli could say, well, I'm not involved. I'm not doing it. I, you know, they're making choices. They're doing wrong. But he held Eli responsible for what was going on in Israel. Amen. He said, listen, Eli, you have not restrained. You have not held them back. Brother, I don't care who you are in the church. I don't care what your last name is. I don't care if you're a minister. 
Amen. It is the responsibility of every God-called and anointed minister to keep the camp clean. Amen. And if you can't keep the camp clean, God is holding you directly responsible. If you don't restrain another minister, if you don't put judgment on a minister who is off, if you don't put judgment on someone who does not have the anointing, that is doing things contrary to the word of God, you are ushering the presence of God out of your midst. You think that your rule, that you get to determine who's okay and who's acceptable. It is not up to any minister. It is not up to any priest who is acceptable. It is up to God and the word of God and we must be judged by that alone. He should have put Hophni and Phineas down. He should have poured some judgment out on them. You are not offering sacrifices in the temple. You're not. Listen, I don't care if you're of my line. I don't care if you're of my lineage. You guys are committing abomination. Amen. Get out of the tabernacle. But instead, people don't even want to come sacrifice in the tabernacle because Hophni and Phineas, they know they're up to foolishness. Oh, and the people can't rise above their leadership. They can't rise above Eli. It's Eli's job to do something about it, not the people. They couldn't. They couldn't. So some of them just said, we're not even going to go sacrifice anymore. We can't go. Why? Hophni and Phinehas are fooling around. They're sleeping with women at the door of the tabernacle. And Eli won't restrain it. Eli won't put anything, anybody won't put any judgment on it. He won't yank them from the ministry. Why? Probably because they're family. They're his children. And my God, God has sent a word to a little boy named Samuel. Amen. He sent the word to a young child named Samuel. And he said, listen, I will do a thing in Israel. Amen. That the ears of everyone that heareth it shall tingle. Amen. Samuel, I'm giving you a message. Amen. And you're going to be putting judgment on the house of Eli. Eli, a father figure to Samuel. He grew up in the tabernacle. Hannah had consecrated him. Amen. To the, to the work of the Lord. Hophni and Phinehas should have been the examples. Amen. They should have been the ones uh, mentoring and pulling Samuel by the side. And, amen. Showing him the things of God and expounding the scriptures to him. Amen. But God had to come to Samuel with a divine revelation. And he said, I'm bringing judgment to the house of Eli. Let's read on here. That's the backdrop. That's the backdrop. Amen. Why weren't they winning? Because God wasn't with them. God wasn't with them. Why aren't some people prospering spiritually? Why aren't some families prospering spiritually? Why are some congregations not prospering spiritually? Why is the church where it's at? Because God's on, Christ is on the outside. Verse number three. And when the people were coming to the camp, the elders of Israel said, Wherefore hath the Lord smitten us today before the Philistines? Why, why, why are we being defeated? I just don't get it. I don't know what's going on. It's amazing what perplexes some people who call themselves to be ministers. I, I don't know why they weren't healed. I don't know why God's not blessing them that way. You know, we just gotta, we just, I just don't get it. I just don't understand. Let us, oh, let's, let's have a prayer meeting and get down before God and, 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 and get, get something from God and maybe he can show us the error of our ways and if we need to repent, if we need to get things right, we'll do it. They didn't call a prayer meeting. Amen, they didn't, they didn't do any investigating. They didn't dig beneath the surface. They said, I got an idea. Let us fetch the Ark of the Covenant. Let's go get the Ark of the Covenant. I mean, the very artifacts of God are in that Ark of the Covenant. The, the rod that budded, Aaron's rod that budded, the, 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 the pot of manna, uh, the, the two tables of stone. I mean, the, the, 
the artifacts, uh, the, the very symbols of God being with us is with that ark. So let's get the ark. Let's get the ark. Brother, too many people are trying to put duct tape on a broken structure. Amen. They're trying to hold something up. They're trying to hold something together, but they don't have the essence and the substance that actually keeps it together. They went and got the Ark of the Covenant. If you know anything, the Ark of the Covenant wasn't supposed to leave where it was located. Think about this. I wonder who went and got the Ark of the Covenant because on my understanding, this wasn't the Day of Atonement. So the Ark of the Covenant was where? It's in the holiest of holies, right? It's in that second room. Well, the reason why the priest only went into that second room on the Day of Atonement was because if he went out there, if he went in there improperly, if he hadn't made the sacrifice for his sin, if he wasn't wearing the right garments, and he went in there, he would die. But somehow... Somebody was able to go into where that ark was located and they were able to get it and bring it out to the battlefield. Why didn't they die? Because God wasn't there. Why isn't judgment falling on some places? Why, why, why isn't certain things happening? Because God isn't even in the midst for it to happen. God has turned them over. God has turned them over. You can, you can get the ark if you want to. You can shout if you want to. You can testify if you want to. You can sing if you want. You can have it. God has turned. You want the artifacts? Keep the artifacts. If you want to keep pointing back to your history, if you want to keep pulling up the tablets and a rod that budded and a pot of manna, if that's what you want, you can have it. I'm out. If you don't want to put judgment on situations, if you don't want to stand, amen, if you don't want to defend this gospel, if you don't want to be a minister of this gospel, guess what you don't need? Me. You can have it. It's yours. It's yours. They were able to get into the holies of holies because God wasn't there. God wasn't there. Let us fetch the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord out of Shiloh. Unto us that when it cometh among us, it may save us out of the hand of our enemies. So the people went to Shiloh, and they went and got the ark of the covenant of the Lord of hosts, which dwelleth between the cherubims. It was where it was supposed to be. It was in the normal spot. And the sons, and the two sons of Eli, look who's handling the ark. How did they get in the pulpit? How did they get to start touching the sacred things? How did they start to get, amen, to handle the holy things? They're committing fornication. They're taking the sacrifices that were supposed to be burned on the altar and given to God, and they're preparing it and eating it by themselves. They have polluted the sanctuary. Oh, but they're the ones handling the ark. They're the ones... Amen, that all of a sudden get to handle the sacred things. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. They're the ones handling the Ark of the Covenant. Hophni and Phinehas. There was no judgment being put on them. Doubtless, people went to Eli. You know what your sons are doing? Yeah, I've talked to them. Well, there's only so much I can do. We'll, we'll wait for God to work it out. Uh, no, Eli, you're the high priest, bud. Uh, no, Eli, you're the one that God put in that position to keep the things in the tabernacle the way they're supposed to operate. You're not doing your job, Eli. God holds the leadership responsible for the state of affairs. He did not go to the people. He did not even necessarily address Hophni and Phinehas. He held Eli responsible. May God help us tonight. And when the ark of the covenant of the Lord came into the camp, literally had a camp meeting. It came into the camp. All Israel shouted. 
Brother, you better be careful what you're shouting over. You better be careful, amen, what, oh, I'm just shouting because they're all shouting. I'm, I'm clapping my hands because everybody's clapping their hands right now. Brother, you better be careful what you're rejoicing over because you might be rejoicing over iniquity. Amen, you might be rejoicing over sin. Amen, the, all Israel shouted. Oh, they were leaping. They were shouting. They were rejoicing. They were having camp meeting, brother. God is with us. See, we got the Ark of the Covenant. We're inspiring their faith. Uh, we're rallying the troops. Uh, amen. We're going to just get this burst of inspiration. And we're going to just defeat the enemy. We're going to psych ourselves up. Amen. We are going to do, use mind over matter. Amen. And we're just going to force this thing. Brother, when God's departed, he's departed. When God has departed, he has departed. Amen. He's gone. They shouted with a great shout so that the earth rang again. They shouted the house down, brother. They shout. This might have been the most inspiring camp meeting some of these people ever been to to this point. Oh, God's going to bless us now. Oh, they came out so charged. Yeah, they came out so on fire. Oh, we're going to bring these Philistines down. And, amen, I declare it. And Amen, this is going to happen. And we're going to just roll them over. But something was missing. Something was missing the whole time. No one questioned. No, pray with me tonight. Pray with me. Pray with me. No one questioned how the ark got from the holiest of holiest to the camp with no one dying. Maybe someone did. And maybe the priest just said, well, that just shows that God's with us. God's in this. See, no one died. See, God's on our side. How are these things happening? How are things that should never happen happening? Amen. And we don't really see any investigation. We don't see any questioning. Amen. We just see them shouting. They just keep on shouting. When the Philistines heard the noise of the shout, they said, what meaneth the noise of this great shout in the camp of the Hebrews? What is going on? Why are they so happy? We just killed 4,000 people. We just killed 4,000 people. Israel had just been slaughtered. And they're having camp meeting. The devil has literally walked right into their camp and slew 4,000 people. And their response was, let's have camp meeting. Let's just, let's just be encouraged anyway, saints. Let's just go forward anyways. Oh, the devil's trying to discourage us. The devil's trying to bring us down. Amen. No, they just got slaughtered. 4,000 people died. And their response is we're just going to keep on going. Israel wasn't supposed to be losing any battles, ever. 4,000 people dying. People dying in Israel. People dying in Israel because of this priesthood. People dying in Israel because of this ministry. And nobody asking questions. Nobody asking, where's the Lord? You want to know when you're up under a false ministry? Amen. When you can't find the Lord and they tell you to be encouraged anyways. You can't find the evidence that God is in their midst. Amen. And it doesn't even concern them at all. Souls can be dying. Amen. Dying spiritually. Dying physically. Amen. There are serious needs among them. And they don't. They keep on having camp meetings. They keep going back to the, rec the relics. They keep going back to the artifacts. They keep pulling out a rod and a bucket with some manna. Brother, listen, I appreciate those artifacts, but you better have the God of the artifacts. You better have the God that produced those things with you, and that is more than important than actually having the artifacts. 4,000 people slaughtered. And they let's just, just get the ark and keep on going. Let's just keep, we're going to go right over blood. We're going to go right over blood. There's blood running in the... Listen, some of those people weren't even buried yet. Weren't even six feet under. Amen. And they're going on anyway. I hope we see the seriousness tonight. God was on the outside. He left. He left. 
Oh, yeah, it shook the Philistines up for a minute. It shook them up. Oh, the shouting, wow, maybe, maybe God is. I mean, remember, this is the God that parted the Red Sea for them in their past. But you know what did not save Israel? Their past. Despite the fact that even their enemies knew what God had done for them, it did not save them. Listen to me, friend. Your past will not save you. Amen. It will not save you. Just because God was with you at one time does not mean he is with you tonight. Just because God met you at a fellowship meeting 30 years ago does not mean that God is in that place anymore. Amen. There are campgrounds across this country where devils were cast out. Amen. Where they had to get shotguns and shoot an owl down because they saw the devil go into an owl. Amen. There are people, amen, where there, amen, there are campgrounds where crutches used to hang on walls and wheelchairs, brother. Amen. There are places where people, amen, they can remember the very spot where they got saved. Amen. There were campgrounds, amen, where you couldn't even hardly find a place in the morning, amen, to go have your devotion because the young people had been laying out all night long, tearing before God. Amen. There are our campgrounds in this country, amen, where they saw miraculous divine healings, they saw the power of God, they saw the inspiration flow, and if you go there tonight, amen, they're still talking about it, amen, they're still rejoicing over it, they can still whoop up a good emotion here and there, but the God of that camp is gone. And the Philistines were afraid, for they said, God is coming to the camp, they must be shouting, because God came into the camp. And they said, woe unto us. What's going to happen to us? For there have not been such a thing heretofore. But they rallied. Verse number 10. And the Philistines fought. And Israel was smitten. And they fled every man into his tent. Oh, when the day of battle came. When the real test came. When the Philistines said, you know what? Despite your shouts. Despite your camp meeting. We're going to fight anyways. Listen, you're not going to scare the devil out of attacking you. You're not going to just try to, uh, you just try to intimidate him. The day's coming. You rest assured. If you don't actually have the presence of God in your midst, amen, you rest assured tonight. Your day is coming. Your day is coming. Oh, your damnation slumbereth not. Amen. Your judgment is coming. The day will declare it because the Bible says every man's work shall be tried with fire. And the Philistines fought and Israel was smitten and they fled every man into his tent. And there was a very great slaughter. First slaughter, 4,000. Should, should have stopped there. Should have had prayer meeting there. Should have said, whoa, whoa, whoa. Amen. What do we do, Lord? Amen. How do we fix this? Amen. Let's do some soul searching. Amen. Let's, let's, let's forget the camp meeting this year. Let's, we're not getting the ark. Amen. We need to figure out where the Lord is. Where is the Lord? Where is the Lord? Why isn't God with us anymore? But instead, they lost 4,000. And then on the second wave, for the fall of Israel, for their fell of Israel, 30,000 footmen almost eight times as much were lost amen in the second wave because they just would not stop and reflect and say what's missing what's missing something's missing what is missing and the ark of God was taken not only that you lost the very thing you were rejoicing over you lost the very thing you were hoping in. And the ark of God was taken and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, Phinehas, were slain. That ministry was out. God brought judgment down on that ministry. Listen, any ministry, amen, that will not, amen, that will not align themselves, amen, in accordance to the word of God and are violating the standard of the word of God, amen, they will be brought into judgment. I want to skip down to verse number 19. The daughter-in-law of Eli. And the daughter... Listen, Eli fell backward. He was too fat. Fell backward, been eating too well. Not fasting, not burdened. Just eating, just eating too well. Eating the Lord's food. Not putting judgment on nobody. Not concerned about nothing. Fell back and died. 
break his neck. But listen, the daughter-in-law wasn't quite concerned about that. About that. And his daughter-in-law, Phineas' wife, was with child, near to be delivered. And when she heard the tidings that the ark of God was taken, we lost the ark. We lost the ark. We lost the ark of God. That ark was really symbolic of the presence of God. I mean, now I know for sure the presence of God is God. We don't even have the ark. It's in the hands of the Philistines. It's where it most assuredly should not be. When she heard that the ark of God was taken and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she bowed herself and travailed, for her pains came upon her. Oh, she went into labor, my God. And about the time of her death, and about the time, this, this thing killed her. This thing killed her. Amen. Tears so good. She got seriously, I mean, just burned, just tearing her up. And now there is the ministry gone. About the time of her death, the woman that stood by her said unto her, Fear not, for thou hast borne a son. But she answered not. Neither did she regard it. That's unusual, brother. That's not normal. That's not natural. I mean, she didn't even regard her son. And she named the child Ichabod. Saying, The glory is departed from Israel. Because the ark of God was taken and because of her father-in-law and her husband. And she said, the glory is departed from Israel. God's not here. That's what it took for some people to wake up. That's the 34,000 Israelites. Family members slain. Eli gone. Husband gone. That's what it took for her to understand the depth of what transpired there. God's not here. It's amazing how much people are willing to suffer. How much they're willing to take before they'll come to the conclusion that they probably already deep down know. God's not here. God's not here. Something's missing. Amos chapter 5. Amos chapter 5. What's missing? What's missing? Something's missing. Something's not working the way it should. There's things going on that should not be going on. The people I've trusted, the ministry I've trusted, that they would take care of this, they're the, they're the ones guilty. See, it's, 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 it's deeper than I just don't have a confidence in the sister that's testifying. I don't have confidence in the people standing behind the pulpit. I go to them with a situation. You, you know Hophni and Phineas are doing this? It's like in one ear and right out the other. Oh, oh, they're concerned. They're praying about it. They tell you what you want to hear, but they never put any judgment on it. Where there is not judgment being put on sin, where there is not judgment being put on the world, where there is not judgment being put on the flesh, God's not there. God is not there. You say what you want to say. God isn't there. Amos chapter 5, verse number 4, For thus saith the Lord unto the house of Israel, Seek ye me, and ye shall live. Seek ye me, and ye shall live. But seek not Bethel. But seek not Bethel. There was a time, brother, where you could have went to Bethel and you would have heard Brother Samuel holding revival there. The Bible says he went in circuit every year. Bethel, Beersheba, Gilgal. Every single year, annually. In circuit means he was there on an annual basis delivering the word of God. Brother Samuel. You know what the difference between Samuel and Eli you want to know what the difference? Because Samuel's sons weren't much better than Eli's. And Samuel knew it. But you know what Samuel said? They're not going to be prophets. 
I'm not giving them an endorsement. I don't care if they're my son. I don't care how much I love them. Don't you be following my sons. Lord, you know they're wicked. They're doing that. Not, they're, they're not living the way they were raised. They're not living... Listen, I'm not promoting them. I'm not... I'm not in fact, and I'm not only just not promoting them, I'm putting judgment on them. They're off. They are off. What Eli would never do. What Eli would never do. You could have went to Bethel and heard the word of God at the mouth of Brother Samuel. Amen. Jacob met God at Bethel. That's how it got its name. God himself met Jacob there and made him a promise. Amen. God met him in Bethel. But you know what happened to Bethel? It went into apostasy. It went into apostasy. Amen. It became the school of the prophets. Oh, they produced prophets. They produced prophets. Amen. But they're the prophets whose children who uh, looked up at Elisha and said, Go up, thou bald head. Go up, thou bald head. They couldn't even recognize the truth. Those, those were prophets' children, most likely, that said, Go up, thou bald head. Go up, thou bald head. Apostate children. You know what apostate parents produce? They produce apostate children. Amen. An apostate generation will produce another apostate generation. Amen. A generation that does not have respect for this word, that does not have a respect for this gospel, and does not have a respect for the true prophets of God. What's he, what are they saying? Go up, thou bald head. Go up, thou bald Go up like Elijah did. Go up like Elijah did. Prove you're a real prophet. Go up, thou bald head. Go up. Because Elijah had just gone up in the chariot. You go up, you empty skull. That's what that, you interpret the wording there. It's go up, thou empty skull. You empty headed skull. You don't have nothing. You don't have nothing, Elisha. Go up. If you have God, you go up in the chariot too. Mocking the prophet. How did Bethel go from the place where Brother Samuel was preaching there in circuit every year to where they're mocking the prophet? They're mocking the word of God. Something was missing. Something's missing. Something's missing. Something's not there. Something that was, it's more than just not Samuel being there. God's not there. God's not there anymore. Go not up to Beth, seek not Bethel, nor enter into Gilgal. Pass not to Beersheba. He goes on to say, seek the Lord. People today are worshiping a place. They're worshiping a location. They're worshiping a place where God once was and he is not there. The evidence of him not is, uh, there's no evidence of him being there. The evidence speaks to the contrary. And so guess what people have to wrestle with? They have to wrestle with their sentiments. They have to wrestle with their artifacts. They have to wrestle with their history. But you have to acknowledge whether or not God is there. You have to be able to answer, God is here. God, see, some people know God's not in the midst. If you were to ask him point blank, is God there? Does God meet you there on Sunday morning? Does God meet you there on Sunday night? Does God meet you there on Wednesday? Does God meet you there on Friday? Does God meet you at your camp meetings? How many people have been healed? How many people are actually saved? How many people are staying saved? Is God there? Are you convinced of it? Beyond all doubt, God is with us. God is there. And sad to say, some people are trying to convince themselves. Amen. And they pretty much believe it, but they know not. They've come to a place where they've deceived themselves into thinking God is still in that place or God is still with them. And they're going to be like Samson and they're just going to keep on going and they're going to go out just like other times. But something's missing. Something's missing. The Laodicean church is missing. Something vital. And the Laodicean church doesn't even know. Many who have claimed and have had the evidence of God with them have lost the presence of God out of their midst. And the products, the fruit of it, is the mess that we have on our hand today. With no glee in it tonight, there is a confusion in the land 
because Christ hasn't been at the head of his church like he ought. There have been winds of division, false doctrine, from one side of the spectrum to the other, anywhere but the middle of the road, anywhere but the straight and narrow way. There's been waves of fanaticism, there's been waves of compromise. Some have gone beyond the mark. And I'll say that, listen, fanaticism is just as deadly as compromise. It is just as deadly as compromise. Some might even be able to argue that fanaticism is deadlier than compromise. But either way, they are both deceptive. Compromise, you can rest in your fanatical uh, attire. You can rest in your fanatical outlook. You can have your perspectives. Amen. You can have, a, you can have a, a, a security in your traditions. Amen. And think and rest in that rather than having the actual presence of God. Some people have, some, uh, have substituted a fanatical standard for the actual presence of God in the midst. And it's sad to say, sometimes it's not even the standard itself that is wrong. It's not even the standard itself that is sinful. But they have taken that standard and lifted it up so high that they've substituted it for the presence of God. Amen. Some people have lifted up a standard such as you can't have a beard, you can't have facial hair, and they will lift that standard up so high they won't fellowship someone who has facial hair. Amen. That's a, that's a test of fellowship. That is a mark that you have to have, and they have substituted it for the presence of God. I, I, I'm sorry. Listen. Maybe, maybe there was a time it was expedient... I'm not knocking any preacher. I'm not, I don't have anybody in mind. But really, amen, it is, it is not necessary to lift up preaching against a certain color. I, I don't have anybody in mind. I'm not getting on a hobby horse tonight. But listen, not wearing a certain color, amen, is not a substitute for spirituality. And it has gone so far in some camps that they are nitpicking the color of someone's undergarments. I'm not trying to be funny. I'm not trying to be crude tonight. But that's where it goes. And you got sister ministers coming into sisters' dorm rooms to inspect that their undergarments are the right color. Brother, I want to tell you, anybody in this land in any position of authority, someone's undergarments get a different vision. Please find a real burden. It is fanatical. It is a fanatical spirit and it's not of God. Amen. Early on in the late 1800s, early 1900s, there was a doctrine that came across the pulpits and many ministers, got, some ministers, I won't say many, but a good significant amount of ministers, amen, got caught up in it in a teaching of a third work of grace. Meaning that you got so consecrated, amen, you got so devoted to God, amen, that you, uh, that you no longer needed or desired the liberties that come within the marital union. Promoted that thing and took out some of the best. Why? They want to be spiritual. They want to be spiritual. There's a pride that comes along with that thing, brother. There's a pride that comes along with that thing. Do you get the third work yet, brother? You find the third work? I got it. One of the ministers that so advocated that doctrine fell to adultery. There's no grace in it. There's no grace for that. See, trying to go beyond the mark, there's no grace in going beyond the mark. You're going beyond the grace of God. You're trying to go, you're trying to add to the scriptures. You're trying to go, God isn't providing grace for that. God isn't providing grace for your religious pride. People want to hold traditions on people. Want to call you on a certain holiday just to make sure you're not celebrating. Come on, I'm not, listen, I'm not I'm making that up tonight. I'm not making that up. You've substituted something. Amen. You, you're going beyond the mark. Fanaticism is trying to go beyond the mark. Compromise is falling short of it. Just find the mark. Just find the mark. Be satisfied in being a saint of God. Amen. Don't try to be less than a saint of God. 
Don't try to be a super saint of God. Be a saint. Be a saint. Down through the years, compromise. Let's go on along that line of fanaticism. 1 Timothy 4 3 talks about forbidding to marry, abstaining from meats. That's where some seeds of fanaticism started in the morning time church. And pretty soon you got preaching that if you're going to be a priest, you got to be celibate and this, that, and teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Adam Clark says these hypocritical priests pretending that a single life was much more favorable to devotion and to the perfection of the Christian life. If you want to be perfect, you want to be a real Christian, you become a priest and you be celibate and you don't eat meat on Fridays. You only have fish. Get a little mark on your forehead every year around Lent. All this, other, you get to give up stuff. For th- Listen, stuff that's not even in the word of God. I'm sorry if your church has held it for 40, 50 years, a certain tradition or a certain standard, but if it's not in the word of God, you really need to drop it. You really need to drop it. And some people feel like, man, if I drop this, and maybe God showed it to you. Listen, I, listen I'm not telling you that you, 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 you do what you, God does show you to do, but you don't hold things on people that are not in the word of God. You're going to go beyond the grace of God. Compromise, falling short of the mark. Listen, modesty, where is it gone today? There are too many places that call themselves Church of God and their people are not modest. It's too tight. Amen. We don't need to see the curvature of your body. Not in the Church of the Living God. Why? And I'll get to it in just a moment because time is getting away from us. But listen, all that we do is to exalt Christ. And Christ is not being exalted when the world is coming into the midst. And Christ isn't being exalted when fanaticism comes in either. The focus gets taken away from Christ. Modesty. Your sleeve, your sleeve should be the proper length. You should be able to raise your hand. You should be able to bend over. Amen. You should be able to move around. Amen. Without exposing yourself. The jeans shouldn't be tight. The pants shouldn't be tight. Don't wear slim fit if you're not slim. May God help us. Amen. People falling short of the mark. Amen. And the problem is, is that you may say, oh, it's just along these certain lines of modesty and we still wear some skirts and we still have... Listen, the problem is, is that when you start letting the world in, it becomes the exaltation of worldly spirit and not the exaltation of Christ. It's the exaltation of flesh. Entertainment, divine healing. Amen. The way you start getting people talking about how, amen, if their headache isn't gone by noon, they go get their aspirin. Compromise, compromise, compromise. First John 2.15 still says, Love not the world, and neither the things that are in the world. For the love of the world, for the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, they're not of, God, of the Father, they're of the world. The world and Christ don't mix. And all of these issues I've just named and many, many more have resulted in breaks in fellowships, in fellowship down through the years. It's the result of Christ not being at the helm. Some things you can't fellowship. I, I, and some divisions, doubtless, are justifiable. I'm not saying you just fellowship anything and everything. Amen. But the overarching, the overall reason why we're in the confusion that we're in today is not because Christ has been at the head of his church having everything the way he wants it. Christ has all the answers. If Christ were to able to have his way, splits and divisions would not happen. How, how is that possible, Brother Nathan? I won't turn there. Acts chapter 2, though, they talked about they were all in one accord. They were praying. They sought, they received the Holy Ghost, and the Holy Ghost was manifested among them. They got definite direction and power. See, this is not about having a minister's idea or what my, what my take is on a certain scripture. Listen, we've got to find out what the Holy Ghost wants us to believe. The Bible says that the Spirit will guide us into all truth. 
So there's not two different ways to see divine healing. There's not four different ways to see marriage. There's not six different ways, amen, for us to see fundamental, for us to see sanctification or cleansing. The Holy Ghost meant something when he wrote it. He meant something when he inspired holy men of God to write as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. He had something in mind when he had them write it. We need to know what the Holy Ghost had in mind. And you don't get it by just tossing a bunch of ideas around. But you better get up in your upper room, amen, and get a definite uh, reception of the Holy Ghost. Acts chapter 4, verses 13 and 16 the chief priests and elders brought in Peter and some of the disciples because they had healed a man who couldn't, I believe he couldn't walk. And if you were to go and read there in Acts chapter 4 around verse 15 or 16, the elders kind of have a conversation among themselves because they're perplexed. They don't know what to do with Peter because the man is standing there walking. It's undeniable. So they really want to arrest Peter. They really want to do something to Peter, but they cannot deny that something happened to that man. Brother, that will clear up the confusion in the land today. The manifestation of the working of the Holy Ghost will clear up the confusion in the land today. Amen. You can't deny a lame man who you saw could never walk all of a sudden standing there next to you. You can, you can try to talk about it. You can try to still, amen, counsel about it. And we don't like this. And we're going to threaten them. And ooh, scary. You're going to threaten us. He's walking. Don't preach in the name of Jesus anymore. Uh, Okay. Okay. He's walking. And you think I'm going to stop? Throw me in jail. I know God's with me. Beat me. Kill me. Everyone you kill, you guys get, we get two more Christian converts. So lay me on the block. I'll just get a one-way trip to glory. I'm out. See ya. And guess what? Blinded eyes are still being open for every time. Every time they tried to put down a Christian, two more would pop up. That was the ratio. They could not stamp them out. The more they tried to stamp them out, the more they grew. The more they tried to shut down their services, amen, the brethren kept on going. They tried to stone Paul. They tried to stone Paul. What what happened? It says he, he shook off the dust and he went and preached in the next city. Could not stop them. Listen, when you have the manifestation of the power of the Holy Ghost, amen, nobody can stand in your way. That is what is needed. I'm not talking about just following a sign, but you need an affirmation, a confirmation of the Holy Ghost. And I'll say this, none of the fellowships in this land have it like that. There's nothing that one fellowship has that puts them head and shoulders above the rest. They'll all point to something in their history. They'll all point to a divine healing. They'll all point to an amazing thing that happened. But brother, who has the undeniable power of God? Can we come to your meeting with a need in our body and have our faith produced to such a level that I leave that meeting healed? And what I mean healed, I don't mean a touch. I don't mean you felt better for a few days in the meeting. I mean you never dealt with that thing again. Affliction will not rise the second time, the Bible says. Amen. You shouldn't come in jumping out of your wheelchair for a few days and then I see you in the next meeting wheeling yourself in. I shouldn't see you making some proclamation in the meeting that you're going to have this happen and you're going to claim this for God and this, that, and the other, and it never happened. In Acts chapter 6, they need to, the, the widows in the daily ministration of the church were being neglected. And so the ministry said, listen, it is not, it is not acceptable. It's not meet for us to leave off the word of God to go serve tables. It's not that they were too proud to go serve uh, tables. That, that just doesn't make logistical sense. I'm giving, they're giving themselves to the work of the ministry. I can't be involved in so much the temporal affairs of the church. But they said, wait a minute. We're not just saying, oh, you've served tables before. You used to be a waiter. Uh, you used to be a, you used to be a dishwasher. Oh, you're pretty good with money. Uh, you, you got some talent. That's not how they figured that out. They said, listen, you find seven men full of the Holy Ghost. We can't just have anybody functioning in the church. You know why there's been so much confusion in the land today? That people should not, who, who should not have been functioning, functioning. 
People that had no business touching the ark. People had no business teaching Sunday school. People had no business being a song leader. People had no business being on the board. People had no business sniffing it. Because they had some talent, because of their last name, because of how long they had been around, because of their seniority, they got, pl- in, they got places they should have never been. And you ruin the integrity of the church when you do that kind of stuff. What is the purpose of the church? It's to lift up God. It's to lift up Christ. In John 12, 32, he said, And I, if I be lifted up, will draw all men unto me. And then he went on the cross. He was speaking of his death. And he died. The crucified Christ is the focus. The one that spilt his blood For the church is the whole purpose of the church. The purpose of the church is to get souls saved. Amen. To show them a way out of sin. Amen. To show them a way off the streets. Amen. To show them that there is deliverance from the bondage of sin. If you are in sin tonight, the purpose of the church, amen, is to show you a way out of sin. You do not have to live in sin tonight. There is not one sin you have to commit tonight. If you want to be free from the bondage of sin... It's here for you. That's the purpose of the church. It is a soul-saving station. You got to lift up Christ. You got to glorify Christ. Christ must be exalted in what you wear. That's why we preach modesty. And Christ isn't exalted in a skin-tight clothing. clothing. He's just not. God has to be glorified. Christ has to be lifted up in your actions. He has to be lifted up in your conversation. He has to be lifted up in all that you say and do as an individual in your home and in your local congregation. Do you have the Holy Ghost? Do you have that? Do you, can you say tonight, I have the Holy Ghost? Can you say that with assurance tonight? If you can't say that with assurance tonight, we're bound for some issues in your individual experience, and please don't function. To pre- it is all about Christ. We must preach Christ. And, and when I say preach Christ, I'm not talking about preaching general. To preach Christ is to preach his word and to make application of it. He told Timothy, preach the word. Be instant in season. Sometimes you're going to have to reprove. Sometimes you're going to have to rebuke. Sometimes you're going to have to exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. You're going to have to make application of the gospel, Timothy. You know what carnal people do? They look for loopholes. And they feel justified when they find one. They think they found one. Oh, oh, you know, you wear glasses, so is that trusting God? Oh, okay, wisecrack. Did you ever wear braces? Is, Is that trusting God for your teeth? As they got a cabinet full of medicine. Justify, trying to find the loophole, trying to find the loophole, trying to find the loophole. It's off. It's off. It's off. It's off. Saved and sanctified people don't look for loopholes. Some people claim that they're not going to go to church anymore because they're just too hurt and they've lost confidence. Well, listen to me. You might have been hurt, but Christ didn't hurt you. We're here to exalt Christ, not somebody that hurt you. So that excuse isn't going to fly. We've all been hurt. Everybody, every, listen, here's the thing about hurts. Anybody who's been around the church of God for any amount of time has been hurt. We've all been hurt. Everybody has been offended. We've all been devastated. We've all shed some tears. We've had some lonely moments. Guess what? It's, it's probably going to happen again. Offenses are going to come. Jesus did say, well, by whom the offenses come, but they're going to come. You're going to be offended. You're going to have some hurts. You're going to have some setbacks. It's, you're going to take it out on, what are you trying to do? Take it out on God? You're going to backslide? You're going to stay home? I mean, what are we doing here? Christ didn't hurt you. Men may hurt you. People will hurt you. Situations can hurt you, but Christ isn't hurting you. And we're exalting him. The job of the church is to lift him up. I'm sorry that people have let you down, that they shouldn't have been functioned. They shouldn't have been up. They, should, they, were, they were out of order. And God will deal with them. God will bring every work into judgment. But Christ loves your soul tonight. And he died for it. And he died so that you could be a part of the, 
beautiful church of God. Some people feel whatever the ministry tells me, that's just what I'm going to do. I've heard them. I heard, recently, a brother said, I, even if, if the minister preached rank heresy, I would still follow him. Said it publicly. I'll still follow him. Brother, that's not exalting Christ. That's exalting a ministry. If you're following your ministry with no questions asked, you're not exalting Christ. You're not exalting Christ. You're exalting your ministry. You're exalting your ministry. It, we're not here to exalt a ministry. We're here to exalt Christ. Closing. There's been a shift of focus. And I, I know I've gone a little lengthy tonight, but this burden was on me today. It's been a shift of focus. It's been a shift away from the exaltation of Christ. It's become more about ministers. Who, who are you with? Who are your associations? It's become more about groups. It's more about the lifting up of places. Loyalties. Where do your loyalties lie? But there's been less outreach. The focus around the church of God today has become far too inward. We have this. We do this. God has blessed us. Bro, brother, there is a lost and dying world out there that needs to know the church of God message. When it starts becoming more about you and the people that you associate with on a regular basis, it becomes less about Christ. Because when you lift up Christ, it will draw all men. When's the last time you've seen a missionary go out? When's the last time you've heard someone say, you know, I'm really burdened for somebody in a foreign land. I, I want God to call me to be a missionary. I want to go take the gospel somewhere else. You don't find that very often in Listen, a lot of these places that they call missions, they're not missions at all. They're not missions at all. They're getting funded by somebody. There's already probably been established work down there, and they sent someone down there to maintain the same kind of congregation that we have in the United States, but there's no real missionary work getting done. Many are more focused on their lives, their success, their own goals and aspirations, while God's house lies in waste and Christ has ended up on the outside knocking saying let me in will anybody let me in will the church of God let me in in closing Revelation 3 and we'll be done go back to our text he wrote unto the angel verse 15 he said I know thy works that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot, so then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, you're still preaching, oh, you're still rich, you're still increased with goods, you're still blessed of God, oh, you're still having the annual camp meeting, oh, we're having reflections uh, because of these campgrounds have been here 50 years and how God has just met us here time and time again and oh, we just, we're just glorying in, in what? That Christ is on the outside? He said, you know not your own condition. And know it's not. And know it's not. That this is your real condition. What's missing around the church of God today? The head of the church. In the revelation, Christ is on the outside. And we're still having camp meeting. Souls getting slaughtered getting hurt, getting ran over, situations all around, bodies not getting healed, people in the grave uh, because we, 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 we just couldn't get a prayer through. Congregations in turmoil. People being split to the four winds. But we're just going on. That's a shame. What's missing? Christ is missing. You cannot stay where Christ is not. You cannot stay where Christ is not. And you owe it to yourself to be honest with God. You do not, you will not be justified burying your head in the sand. You will not be justified by just saying, well, this is all I know. 
you will not be justified by saying, well, I'm just going to make sure I do right and I stay saved. No, 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 no. If Christ isn't there, you too will suffer. You'll suffer eternally for it. You have to be where Christ is. What's missing? May God bless you tonight.